I've been, I've heard this presentation about five times already, and I'm just excited to hear it for the sixth time tonight. Uh, so welcome to presentation from the, on the Ohio Witnesses Project. I'm going to get out of the way and let these guys do their thing, because I can't do them justice other than what they can do better themselves. So let me introduce Dean, Dean Gillespie, Mark Gossi, our illustrious speakers. And Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. First of all, thank you to uh, Steve and Tiffin University for having us here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, always love the opportunity to um, spread our mission because just awareness of the problem is uh, a big part of it. It's making people aware of wrongful convictions and how they happen. Um, let me just ask people, how many, before hearing you know, any marketing about this event or anything, were aware of Innocence Projects? Raise your hand. Okay. How many people were aware of the phenomenon uh, that you turn on the news and you can see people being wrongfully convicted and getting out of prison, DNA is proven the innocent? How many people are just aware of that generally? Okay, most people are still, some aren't. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the innocence movement generally. I'm going to talk about um, some of the causes of wrongful conviction. I'm going to talk about Dean's case. And then I'm going to turn things over to Dean. He's going to talk a little bit about his, his ordeal. Dean here um, spent 20 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit and um, was released two years ago, a little bit over two years. So, um, and he'll be happy to answer any question you have. And so some of you who've been in classes with him earlier today know that. So as you're going through this and listening to him talk, think of anything you can possibly imagine and he'll be happy to answer. Um, that's how we're going to do it mostly through Q&A. So the um, American criminal justice system, you know, we, we have all these tremendous rights that people fought for for years and years, like proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and things in the Bill of Rights, and um, criminal defense attorneys have a right to a speedy trial, and the right to subpoena witnesses, and all these things that didn't exist a couple hundred years ago. Um, but if you go back through time, the last few decades, um, you know, prior to the beginning of the innocence movement, um, there was a real arrogance about our system, which I, I think perhaps comes from, we do have so many good things about it. Um, anytime there's somebody who's convicted in prison and you have the concept of prisons, there's going to be inmates who say, I didn't do this, I was wrongfully convicted, they're going to write letters to the judge, you know, all that kind of stuff, and that's been going on for centuries. Up until we had DNA testing a couple decades ago, when an inmate would write a letter to a judge saying, I didn't do this, I am innocent, the judge would write these decisions that would show this great arrogance in the system. They, you know, typical language was, um, you know, this is the greatest criminal justice system in the world, we do not make mistakes. You are convicted by a jury of your peers. You are guilty. Knock it off was the basic, basic gist. And that was widely believed. Um, one of the famous quotes from uh, Justice Frankfurter of the US Supreme Court was, it's, you know, it's the justice system's worst nightmare um, to convict an innocent man. And he said, fortunately, that's just a dream because it doesn't happen. But along came DNA testing in the early 1990s, which was really a godsend to our system. It helped us learn new things about the system that we didn't know before. Um, the, the innocence movement really started with a guy named Barry Sheck, who you guys are probably, most of you, too young to know about the O.J. Simpson trial. But he was um, the DNA specialist who represented O.J. Simpson. And uh, but he was a law professor, just like me, at um, Cardozo Law School in New York. And he ran what's called a legal clinic. And most law schools have these, where law students can represent people, poor people charged with minor crimes. They can go in while they're still students and they can get hands-on experience in court. Um, but before he did that, he was a public defender in the Bronx, and he did all these serious like rape and murder cases as a public defender. And he had a guy back then when he, that he represented, convicted of rape, and he was always convinced that this guy was innocent. Uh, but the guy was convicted, witnesses identified him, and he went to prison, and this case just ate him up. So years later now, he's a professor, he's running this legal clinic, and he reads about this new technology being used in England by prosecutors to prove guilt in cases, DNA technology. And he starts thinking about it, and he's like, you know what? I remember back at the time of my trial, that guy was convicted. They had semen from the perpetrator. You know, if I could find this, this, this semen from this old case that submitted to DNA testing, maybe I'd be able to show once and for all whether my guy's innocent. And long story short, he was able to do that. And shocker of all shockers, he came back and proved his instincts right. This guy actually was innocent. He had been wrongfully convicted and spent many years in prison for something he didn't do. So I was actually a prosecutor in New York City at the time when all this was going on, and I can remember reading about this in the paper. And so did a lot of people around the country. 
Uh, this was big news that somebody had been proven innocent. And uh, this got in national news, and so inmates all around the country started writing in to Barry Sheck's law school saying, you know, I'm innocent, help me, do that DNA testing thing. Uh, so he took his group of students, and they started looking into these letters from people on death row in Texas and death row in Oklahoma and all these different places, and uh, was trying to find the DNA in these cases. And, and within just a few years, they had exonerated about 75 people around the United States. And uh, a great number of those original exonerees were on death row at the time they were exonerated. So this got more and more press. And I can remember uh, um, when I was in New York at the time, a New York Times cartoon was sort of making fun of this. And it had these babies literally in diapers crawling down through these uh, old Shawshank Redemption prison halls carrying prisoners, holding their hands and getting them out of prison. So it was saying, this is law students, law students, that is shaking up the system like that. Um, it was sort of blew people's minds. So, as this got more and more attention, different states and law schools around the country started setting up innocence projects following that same model. Law professors supervising students, the students doing most of the work digging into these cases. And um, now they're pretty much in every state, but I think one or two, and now it's actually spreading around the world. And um, together, all these innocence projects, this innocence movement has now proven over 1,200 people innocent across the United States, and that number keeps growing every day. It'll be 1,300 within just a, a month or two. Um, and there's a, there's a website called the National Registry of Exonerations that's run by a joint project between the Stanford and Michigan law schools. And for every one of those cases, it's been vetted, and they've, it, they've determined that it meets the factors and the person's been exonerated. It has all the documents of the case. You can learn all about it. So um, in Ohio, we started ours in, in 2003. And actually, I came from it as a prosecutor, and my first job was at another school where they, not UC, where they had a, a, a pre-existing innocence project in another state. And um, the professor who ran it was on sabbatical that year. Since I was the new creme professor, they were like, you know, we want you to run this, and I'm the new guy, I can't really say no. But coming at it from a prosecutor's mindset, I was actually very skeptical about it. And I remember sitting in the first meeting, and um, two of the students had just gone on a prison visit and met, met this guy in prison, one of the clients named Herman May. And they were just so emotionally moved by his story, and, and they just so deeply believed what he was saying. And I can remember sitting there just thinking, that this is the biggest bunch of crap I have ever heard. Because I looked at the case, and several witnesses had identified him. Um, and it just to me, it's like these bleeding heart students, they have no idea what the real world's about, you know, buying this line of baloney from this, from this inmate. And uh, what happened is they ended up doing DNA testing and came back and proved him innocent. And so that was a real eye-opening experience for me. And then, as I had to run the program that year, I met other people that had been exonerated, and I started thinking, oh my God, this is not only something I'm starting to believe in, but becoming passionate about. So I ended up founding the one in Ohio at UC Law School. I got a job there the next year. Um, so far, we've had um, 17 people that we've gotten out of prison, all Ohioans, on the basis of innocence. And together, they've uh, served almost 300 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. Um, Dean served 20 years. We have a guy, Raymond Tallard, who, who served 29 years in prison. So more of his life was in prison um, than it was on the outside. Even today, he's been out for several years. So um, one thing that people always ask is, what do you think is the percentage of people in prison who are actually innocent? And um, I actually, I can't give you that number. I have no idea. Um, but Justice Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court um, gave a speech a few years ago and he, I think at that time, the National Registry of Exonerations had 900,000 people on it or something like that. And he said, well, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people during this 20-year period of the innocence movement have been convicted of serious crimes, and there's only been 900 or 1,000 of them proven innocent. So that's about 0.0001%, right? So that's a very small, that's a drop in the bucket. That means we get it right the vast majority, 99.999% of the time, or something like that. Um, and I, I, can, I can't tell you what the percentage of wrongful convictions are, but I can tell you that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, how do we know that? Well, if you take all the inmates who have written to an innocence project saying, I'm innocent, please help me, tens of thousands of people through, through the time this, this has been in existence, um, the first thing students do when they get a letter like that is they pull up the basic facts of the case to determine what happened, just in a generic sense. What's the storyline? Um, and the vast majority of cases, something like 95% of them, there's nothing DNA can do to prove the person innocent or guilty. Like if somebody shot me through that window, somebody walked through that door and shot me and took off running and got in the getaway car, there's no DNA here, right? There's nothing we can do. So the students just look at the basic facts and they go, well, this is a non-DNA case. 
That's what we can really do. So most of the cases, about 95% of them, this is all the people claiming innocence, writing the innocence projects, about 95% of them get cut. You're down to a sliver. Of the people that should have DNA in their cases because of the way the crime occurred, the next step becomes the students start searching, making phone calls, going to police departments, seeing if they can find the DNA from this 20, 30 year old case. Right? And um, you know, in some instances, they track down the retired court reporter from the trial who still has all the files from her cases in her basement. I mean, there's just chaos. There's just no set way of preserving this old evidence. We had one case, we opened up the box of evidence and it was full of dead bats uh, that had been kept in the police property room. Uh, but about 75% of the time, the evidence can't be found. It's been lost or destroyed. Um, the police threw it in the trash after the case was all over with. And that's actually what happened in Dean's case. So if these are the people claiming innocence right into innocence projects, about 95% of them don't have DNA in their case when you screen them. So you're down to a sliver. Of this sliver, about 75% of the time you can't find the DNA. So you're talking about some tiny little sliver that are lucky enough to be able to go to DNA testing in their cases. All right? And all the exonerations out of the innocence um, movement have come out of that little sliver of just people who are lucky enough to have DNA. Okay? Now, of the people who are lucky enough to have DNA in their cases, about half of the time the DNA testing comes back and confirms guilt. And in our project, and I think any project, that's the best possible result you can get. And we tell our students, confirming guilt means that the bad guy has been on the street committing more crimes. The victim didn't make a mistake. The system worked, and that's what you want every single time. In fact, the one case we've had in Seneca County um, was one of Rex Klinger, who was convicted of murder. He wrote to us and wanted DNA testing. We didn't know if he was innocent or guilty. We petitioned the prosecutor, one of the rare instances, the prosecutor in this county agreed to DNA testing. Usually we have to fight for years just to get the DNA testing. And it, we got the testing, the judge agreed, and it came back it, uh, incriminating. Um, it pointed toward his guilt, as, just as the evidence of trial act. And so we withdrew from the case and that was the end of it. Um, about 50% of the time when you get testing, that's what happens. Roughly speaking, about 25% of the time, they come back and they say at the lab, you know, this has been sitting on a shelf for 20 years, it's been in a box with dead bats. Um, the evidence is just too degraded. We can't get a result here. But, but roughly 25% of the time when you get testing, it comes back proving the person innocent. Okay, so what's, what's important to recognize right now is this little sample of people that get testing, 25% of which are innocent, there's no difference between them and all these people out here. There's no reason to think statistically 25% of these people out here are innocent. Um, these people don't have stronger cases. It's not like all the weak cases are over here. They're all the same. Um, and some of these people are on death row right now in America. And they don't have DNA in their cases. Um, so then people will sometimes ask me, well, does that mean you think 25% of the people in the United States in prison are innocent? And again, the answer is no, because we're dealing with a subset of people. So the people in prison who are writing the innocence projects, who've been screaming and hollering for years that they're innocent, who actually take the time to fill out a gigantic questionnaire and have this kind of process start, which is a small subset of the overall US uh, prison population. So what about people who aren't writing the innocence projects, aren't screaming and hollering that they're innocent? Uh, a few years ago, the governor of Virginia became interested in this issue. And he ordered his attorney general to, to take some cases, rape cases, where the people had been convicted before DNA testing based on eyewitness testimony and where the DNA evidence, the semen from the hospital or the pubic hairs or whatever was collected as evidence, still exists and run the test. And I believe it was 42 cases they were able to identify that met those criteria. And a DNA testing came back and proved two of them innocent. Two out of the 42. These are people that weren't even writing the innocence projects. And so, you know, these people are interviewed. Some of these people that are later proven innocent that didn't even scream and holler. And they say, I mean, basically, I'd lost faith in humanity. I couldn't get out of my bunk in the morning. You know, that's why I wasn't doing anything. So we know there's some out there that aren't even in the Innocence Project pool um, who are probably innocent. So, but again, I don't know the number. This, um, when, when you have a system that thinks it never makes mistakes, and even have Supreme Court justices writing opinions that we don't make mistakes, and then something comes along like this that sort of uh, shakes people up, and you got people like Dean here, who have been great victims in their entire family of the criminal justice system, it makes people start scratching their head and going, what went on? What's going on? What can we do to, do, to, be, to be better? And as a result of this, social scientists have branched off of whole new areas of psychology 
and research to try to understand what we're wrong in these cases and how we can do a better job. They ask questions like, how come in some of these DNA exonerations you've got 6, 8, 10, 11 people on the stand all saying, I got a clear look at the guy's face and that's definitely the perpetrator and DNA testing comes back and proves all these people wrong. How in the world can that happen? How can you have a fingerprint expert that took the stand and said, I compared the fingerprint from the bloody knife that the perpetrator held and I compared it to the fingerprint um, of the defendant when he was arrested and this is a match. And now we know that it's not a match. How can this happen? So they began studying the, um, the causes of wrongful convictions, trying to find solutions. But I ask you, what do you guys think are the causes of wrongful convictions? When something goes wrong and you look at that case, what was the type of evidence that convicted the person? Yeah. Well, sometimes I think some stuff can be planted, like in certain cases, but things are planted and people are like, convicted and then after the fact they figure out that the stuff, that what was there, didn't belong there in the first place. You mean evidence planted by the police? Not by, by, not by the police, but by the person who actually commits the crime. They could have staked out somebody else and then... To okay, police. frame them? Yes. Um, there, there are probably some instances of wrongful convictions like that. Those may be hard to prove, but those are not the type that actually pop up on the radar. Now, one related to that that's very similar is wrongful convictions because of what we call snitch or informant testimony. Someone who was involved in the crime or they committed the crime themselves and they cut a deal and they convinced the police of this story that I saw it, I'm not the one that did it, and they point the finger at somebody else only to help themselves out in their own criminal cases. Or they're in prison, for, they're in jail for a long time, they're getting ready to go down, somebody gets picked up for a crime and they make up, this guy confessed to me when we were in the cell last night, so they can work off their own beef with the prosecution and that becomes the, the state's pivotal witness at trial, but it's somebody who's making it up. Um, so informant testimony, when somebody's getting a deal in exchange for testimony, is very problematic and leads to a lot of wrongful convictions. That's sort of related to what you said. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, the number one cause, 75% of these cases involved inaccurate eyewitness testimony. One of the cases, I think it was 10 or 11, I've got to look that up, I can't remember, but 10 different witnesses got on the stand and said, I could see the guy and I'm confident that's the perpetrator of DNA and I've proven him wrong. In the Raymond Tyler case, the guy I mentioned in Ohio that we got out and spent 29 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Um, that was an accident, by the way. We'll get to that later. Um, 29 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Four different people identified the perpetrator, got on the stand and said, that's the guy, and then we're very confident about the testimony and the DNA proving completely wrong. So social scientists start saying, how in the world can this happen? Let's start studying eyewitness identification. Let's start studying human memory. And what we've learned is that eyewitness identification testimony, and in fact, human memory generally, is not nearly as reliable as we give ourselves credit for. And we tend to think of our memories as, you know, I see a crime, I see something occur, my mind is like a tape recorder. I hit record, I'm recording what happens, and then later when I'm on the stand and I'm asked what happened, I can hit the play button and play it back. And I repeat it out exactly as it happened. What we now know, and I'll talk about some of these studies in a minute, is that our memories are a lot like Wikipedia. They're constantly being edited, and we don't even know they're being edited. We're editing them ourselves because of our own biases and our hopes and beliefs, wishful thinking, what we want things to be, and all of a sudden our memory conforms to that. Other people making suggestions to us, like Wikipedia, other people going in and modifying our memory. And so we've got to get to the point where we, as prosecutors and police officers, understand how fragile human memory is and that when we come to a crime scene that we're investigating, we rope that off and treat it very delicately the way we do now with blood or fingerprints. But we don't do that right now. Some of the studies, there'll be a room of people like this right here, and they'll, I'll show you slides of two cars coming together and hitting. Um, the, you know, six or seven slides, they get closer and closer and closer until they hit. And then the group's broken into two different groups and you're asked to survey. And the only difference between this, the two surveys are, the first question and the first one is, question survey one is, how fast were the cars going when they collided? You're supposed to estimate what you thought the speed was. The second one starts with, how fast were the cars going when they crashed? Okay? What do you think is the difference between using the word crashed and using the word collided? What do you think happens? Just a little suggestion from the interviewer like that. Slightly more loaded word like crashed, causes people to estimate the, high, the speed much higher than in the survey where they use the word collided. Now, 
that's probably not too surprising because something like speed is very subjective and hard to measure in the first place. So getting someone to overestimate that probably shouldn't be too hard. But the next question is something like this. Was there broken glass in the video? Did any windshields or taillights bust? There's no ambiguity at all what the right answer is. The right answer is no. There's no glass anywhere on any of those slides. But simply by using the word crashed instead of collided, you get more people now that falsely remember that they saw broken glass. Think how slight that suggestion is. Just all they're doing is using the word, it's not even a spoken word with emphasis. The written word crashed instead of collided. And you get many, many more people now saying yes, there was broken glass in that video. And then when they're asked how confident they are in that answer, they're very confident. And then you can continue manipulating the things they saw simply from very slight suggestions. They do eyewitness identification studies where you'll all be here in the room and um, somebody will walk out of the door over there, um, which of course, just like when the, the, the screen went on, I saw everybody in the audience look at the screen. But somebody inappropriately walks through that door and starts walking toward me, everybody here is going to turn and watch that person. They all watch him walk in, and he comes over here and grabs a laptop from my briefcase sitting on the desk, sitting on the stage, and walks out. And he walks out slowly so everybody can see his face. And then I say, surprise everybody, you're really here for an eyewitness ID study. We're going to see how well you can identify the guy, the actor that just walked in and stole my briefcase. So the students are broken up into different groups. And they simulate the situation where wrongful conviction occurs, which is where the police have a suspect, somebody who they think may have committed the crime, but they're actually wrong. So they create, they do six photos for the students to look at, just like the police do, we call it a six pack. But the guy that walked in is not one of the six. Well, this would simulate a situation where the police have a suspect and they're wrong. But not surprisingly, many, many people end up selecting someone. And they select the photograph that just looks the most like the perpetrator, okay? But what happens next is interesting. The, the, group, the students are in different groups. And in one group, the police officer, the person acting as a police officer, once the witness says, yes, I think it's number two, says, good job, you got the right answer. In other groups, they give no feedback whatsoever. And in the third group, they give sort of a medium level, just sort of like a little bit of influence, like, OK, it sort of sends the message, maybe you got the right choice there. And then they're asked a bunch of questions. And one of the questions is, how confident are you in your selection? Well, the group that we're told they got the right answer gives very high confidence levels. A lot of them come out and say, I'm 100% confident, no doubt about it. They're picking the wrong guy, okay? When they're not given any feedback, they give much more honest or what should be accurate answers. Many more people say, I'm not exactly sure, he just looks the most like it. The next question is, was your confidence level changed or modified by the fact that the officer told you you picked the right person? Absolutely not. I was that confident before. Okay? Now we know that's not true because the only thing that's different between one group and another is that they were given confirmatory feedback. Then they're asked questions, how good of a look did you get of the guy's face between one and 10? How good was the lighting? How many seconds was he there? And the people were told they got the right answer gave much, they're much more confident now in their answers. Oh, I got great looks. The lighting was a 10 out of 10. Much higher than the other groups. And what does this tell you? Um, the way I just described with confirmatory feedback is the way it happens, way too often. When I was a prosecutor, I worked on a case for a long time. We put together a six pack with the FBI agent. And we were very invested in this case. We put a ton of work into it. We believed we had the guy who had done it. When we brought the witness in, she sat down, she looked at it, and she picked out number two. We jumped up and started doing a touchdown dance. Went out in the hall and we're hugging each other. And we had no idea, I had no idea at the time how I'm contaminating that person's memory. And how, by the time that person got on the stand, even if they weren't 100% sure 30 seconds ago when they told me they think it's number two, they're going to be up there saying they're 100% positive. Okay? So we've got to learn that human memory is very fragile, it's very suggestible, um, and it's got to be protected. We've got to have officers doing the lineups that don't give any feedback whatsoever, that accurately record the confidence level, um, and then do all the procedures the right way. What are some other um, causes of wrongful, wrongful conviction, do you think? Yeah. False confession. Yeah, false confession. That's a hard one to wrap your mind around, right? Every single person says, I would not confess to a crime I didn't commit. If I was being interrogated for murder, there's no way in a million years you would get me to confess to something I didn't commit. Absolutely not. Here's an example of somebody who didn't. 
I mean, they pressured him to try to admit things that, that he didn't do. And they gave him you know, incredible plea deals, if you'll just say you did it. Well, after he was in prison for many years, the parole board was going to let him out if he just admit he did it. And he continued to say, I didn't do it. I'm not going to say I did it. But not everybody's that strong. Um, and again, human psychology kicks in. A lot of these individuals who were later proven innocent by DNA confessed. And so they, they do studies afterwards. How in the world did this person who's actually educated and intelligent get into a room and after only eight hours of police officers admit to something like a murder that they didn't commit? Um, and they, they realize that people have different personality traits um, that can cause this to happen. Some people become convinced that they must have blacked out and they must have done it. That the pl police are so confident and pressuring them so hard and saying things like, um, they're allowed to lie to them. We've got your, they'll have a fake phone call from another officer, answer the phone in the interrogation room, just got the DNA results back. And that was your DNA there. They're allowed to do that. Then the suspect being interviewed doesn't know it takes months to get a DNA result. Another phone call, fingerprints came back. The person actually becomes convinced, I must be losing my mind. And they end up um, confessing, right out of confession what the police told them they did. Usually when that happens, after, after a couple days, they're back in their cell saying, this is crazy, I didn't do this. Other people become, they don't believe they did it, but they, they don't think the police can lie to them, so they think, oh my God, I'm gonna be convicted. Somebody's done something to me to put my DNA and stuff there, and they're telling me I'm gonna get the death penalty. My only logical option at this point is to say I did it. Um, there's many different reasons, and not everybody, you may be right that you would not do that under intense pressure. Dean survived that kind of pressure, but um, it's, a, it's amazing how many people I've personally met who have been exonerated, who ended up confessing to crimes they didn't commit. And when you meet them, you'd be very shocked. You would say, that's a pretty tough looking guy. And they ended up doing it. What are some other reasons? Yeah. Circumstantial evidence. And what, what do you mean by that? Uh, it looks like uh, it might have happened, but it didn't really. Yeah, I mean, jumping to conclusions, circumstantial evidence, weak evidence. But you know what's amazing, though, is that a lot of these um, wrongful conviction cases, it's not like this was one the community was worried about. When the crime happened and this guy was convicted, he was the devil. Everybody was absolutely sure. If you wrote on Facebook, I don't think this guy did it, you'd be considered a nut. Right? Everybody's convinced. Every time there's a conviction, the evidence is overwhelming. Right? That's what the community believes. We all want to believe that. That's how the media portrays it everything else. Um, and in many cases it is. But sometimes the cases are, were actually somewhat weak. But when I look at a case, somebody asks me to, to fight for DNA testing for them. I might look at it and go, well, there's pretty overwhelming evidence. My guess is 95, 99% chance this guy's guilty. Because I could be wrong, and it could be the 1%, I'll still fight for the DNA testing just to make sure. Um, but many of these DNA exonerations occurred when, you know, it looked like it was overwhelming. So, um, any other ideas? The, um, another major, major cause of wrongful conviction is uh, this myth that we have about CSI, about forensics. That we've gotten to the point where we have you know, NASA quality scientists that can put men on the moon examining these fingerprints and other things and coming to these conclusions that are just mind blowing and able to solve the crimes. I've watched CSI for about five minutes one day and it made my head want to explode. Um, literally, this, they had a, the one scene I watched had a woman, a uh, forensic scientist, looking through a, um, a microscope at the guy's tie and she was able to identify something on the top, and she kept looking up like she was pondering, and it was cut back and show how the guy's, um, this, this evidence got on his tie in an incriminating way. Like she's figuring that out from looking at the through the microscope, and I'm thinking, my God. Um, you know, a lot of these cases where people were proven innocent, an expert got on the stand in a white lab coat and said, I've analyzed the, the, the fingerprints, and this is a match, or I've analyzed the, the tire tread and the, and the mud that led up to the dead body, and it's a perfect match to this guy's tires, including the amount of wear and tear, everything else. And we now know that's completely bogus. So how does that happen? Well, one guy in, in, uh, in Ireland named Dror, D-R-O-R, and he's been doing some amazing studies that other people have replicated, where he, um, he takes fingerprints, 
And when an expert testifies in a trial, and he has the photos and the fingerprints that he testifies about the match in front of the jury, those are exhibits. Those are public records. So you can go into the courthouse six months later and get copies of, of those exhibits, public records requests, things like that. And he takes them, and he goes to the same expert who testified six months earlier that this was a match. Uh, but experts don't remember a fingerprint they looked at last week, right? All they do is look at fingerprints all day long. So he goes to them and he goes, we're doing a study in cases where fingerprint experts messed up, where they were later found to be innocent, but for some reason they wrongly testified that there was a fingerprint match. Will you help us figure out where this fingerprint expert went wrong? And they look at it not knowing this is one that they testified was a match six months before. In some of the studies, he can get up to 80% of the fingerprint experts to flip their results and see something that's a discrepancy, a difference that they did not see before. Now, one of the things people don't realize about fingerprints is that when somebody's arrested, their thumb is inked, and the officer goes like this and rolls a nice, clean fingerprint. But the guy with the bloody hand who picks up the knife and leaves a fingerprint there doesn't grab the knife and go, mm, I'm going to even roll in a nice, clean fingerprint on that. It's almost always some sort of smear. Right? So there's an amount, a certain amount of art and subjectivity going into the so-called matching of fingerprints. It's not just like a computer program can, can figure this out. Um, and so when they're given different information to start off, it can lead to a completely different result. And it's because human beings suffer from confirmation bias. Right? If we're told at the beginning, which is what happens in most CSI areas in the country now, I'm a police officer, I'm bringing this file over to you, this is the guy that we think did it, there's overwhelming evidence, we just need you to make sure that there's a fingerprint match here to help our case out, you're much likely to end up saying, this is a fingerprint match, because you're going to be looking only for the things that seem similar. If they come to you conversely and say, this is one that has been proven to be an incorrect one, can you tell us where the discrepancies in the fingerprint are? They're looking for the discrepancies, and that's what their mind's filtering, that's what their mind's seeing. All right, so... You know, if you can imagine in fingerprints you get those kind of results, many of these other so-called forensic sciences, sciences are much more subjective. You know, like tire matching and blood splatter and all this kind of stuff. There's a basic uh, assumption in science that uh, testing needs to be done blindly. Meaning the person who's doing the analysis shouldn't know what the right answer is before they start, what they're supposed to do. All right, that's just the scientific method. Um, we've got to set it up, and some of the reforms we have to make are that when information is taken to the CSI departments, they don't know what the right answer is. They don't know if this is a tire track they're supposed to exclude because this is somebody they've eliminated, the police have eliminated, or if this is supposed to be a match. And then we're going to start getting much more reliable answers. But most of these reforms are not taking place. All this is still happening, um, even though the scientific literature pretty undisputedly is finding all kinds of problems the way criminal investigations are done right now. So we are going till 8. We've been talking for quite a while. I'm going to um, quickly talk about Dean's case, turn things over to Dean, and he's just going to talk about a couple of paintings he did in prison and then open it up to questions. Dean is one of the, um, the non-DNA cases. His started off as a DNA case because um, there was some semen from the rapes. And uh, by the time we looked into it, though, it did not exist anymore. It's one of those that fell into the 75% that you can't find it because the police have tossed it away. His was a um, serial rape case where the same guy had raped three women in a very short period of time in August of 1988, and the crime went unsolved for, for several years. The guy did this um, with a very specific MO. He would flash a fake badge and pretend to be a police officer and tell the woman that he, she'd been shoplifting inside the store. This is in you know, public parking lots. Get in the car with him, take her out to some wooded area, quite a drive away, and also the type of sex was very specific. He would force them to perform oral sex on him. Okay? And um, he would, was very chatty with the women, and he would say all these very distinct things, like, I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, I do this because I was molested by my grandfather when I was 12. Uh, I'm a contract killer for the CIA. Um, you know, he would, it's crazy stuff, right? Uh, say all this stuff. Uh, but it was a very specific MO. Crime goes unsolved. For a couple of years, the, date, the police department has the composite sketch of the guy's face all over the place case goes cold. Um, Dean is 25 years old, he's got a very good union paying job at GM, clean record, but is in a very uh, hostile dispute with a supervisor that's been going on for years at GM. Supervisor takes Dean's GM photo, 
goes over to the police department, you know, looks at the wanted poster and goes, oh, that sort of looks like this asshole named Dean. Takes the picture over to um, the police department and uh, gives it to him. The detectives investigate and completely clear Dean because it was an absolute joke. Um, the, the description of the perpetrator did not match Dean at all. One of the things that all three of the women said is he had a very, very dark tan. This was August. Look at Dean. He's as Irish as they get. <laughs> Dean had gray hair. You can see that pink picture he did at the top. He's got the gray temples like me. All the way back at that time, he had that since high school. Um, and they described his hair as brown with a reddish tint, which didn't match Dean's at all. All these discrepancies. But there were actual confirmatory facts that showed Dean could not have done it. For example, one of the victims had remembered the pant size because the guy would drop his pants. She was able to see the tag. You know, they have the waist and the inseam length. And... Um, they looked up Dean's DMV records of his height and weight, and there's just no way he could fit in those pants. So they eliminated him as a suspect. So one detective goes to Arizona, retired. The other detective goes to Florida, retires. And a new detective takes over the case, 26 years old, his first case, who happens to be very good friends with the enemy at Dean's work. So what happens? He brings the picture back over again. The guy creates a very misleading photo spread. It's the kind like in the studies where the people, even though it's not the right picture, they end up picking the guy because it's a very misleading photo, so they pick someone anyway. Um, all three victims identified Dean as, a, as the um, perpetrator. Um, and that's the only evidence they had, was the three eyewitnesses. Um, the officer went to great lengths to manipulate them. For instance, this actually came out of trial. He told the victims, he's not going to look like the guy that raped you, but he's manipulated his appearance. Defense attorney's cross-examining one of the victims and going through all these discrepancies. Dark tan? He doesn't have a tan. Look at his hair color. And then she said, well, he's colored his hair. The defense attorney's like, what? Yeah, he's, the detective told me that he dyed his hair before trial to make himself look different. Was it true? They ended up calling the barber in the rebuttal case. His barber had been cutting his hair since ninth grade. Um, they discussed that his hair color never changed. Um, what happened is, the detectives who had investigated him and eliminated him as a suspect and retired, when they left, the new officer cleansed the file, destroyed all the records that eliminated Dean as a suspect. They destroyed the records that he had been previously investigated and eliminated. They destroyed the records about the pant size that didn't match Dean. And then they made it look like the investigation started for the first time that second time around. And we were able to get the testimony of the two original officers who were still alive had been retired, one in Florida and one in Arizona for many years. Came back and testified in federal court as to all of this, and the federal judge listened to it, found police misconduct, violation of Dean's constitutional rights, and threw out the charges. We also continued to investigate because um, an anonymous tip came in that a man named Kevin Cobb was the one that committed these rapes. We looked up Kevin Cobb, and he had committed a very similar rape where he flashed a badge and he got caught for it. Pretended to be an officer, abducted a woman from a public place, and he had a whole rap sheet of different crimes against women, domestic violence, former girlfriends he'd beaten up, and things like that. So we went and talked to these women. What did we find? Well, he only likes oral sex. Um, in fact, I would ask him, let's actually have real sex. And he wouldn't be able to perform. He wouldn't be able to keep it up. That's the only type of sex he liked. Um, he would tell people he's a contract killer for the CIA. He would tell people that he was from Corpus Christi, Texas, because he had been stationed in the Marines there. He would tell people that he'd been molested by his grandfather when he was 12 years old. All these things that matched the perpetrator and the crimes that Dean was committed for committing, for, was uh, convicted for committing. And um, a state court looked at all that evidence and found that Kevin Cobb was the likely perpetrator of, this, of these crimes and overturned Dean's conviction on that ground. So we actually won in two different courts on two completely unrelated grounds. It was a double whammy against the state. Uh, I'm going to let Dean answer some questions. He's going to start off talking about this painting. Let me quickly say the first question every single time, this is the sixth speech in the last 24 hours. Very first question is, is he going to be compensated? <laughs> is he going to be compensated? Um, he's already filed suit against GM and the police department. Those, those cases take a really long time. Um, that's my belief that someday he will be compensated for this. Why don't you go ahead and talk about this painting. This is, these are paintings that Dean did in prison. This painting here was done for the... Uh, in 2010, the University of Cincinnati hosted the National Innocence Conference that they have every year. Uh, anyone who's been convicted and, and released through the Innocence Project 
is welcome to attendees, the staff, the uh, students, and everything. So uh, 2010, they had they hosted it at, at uh, UC, and they asked the guys if you had artwork or if you had a poem or a story or a song, anything that represented what you were feeling at the time uh, when they asked this to, to portray what your thoughts and feelings were. And I decided to do this painting here of what I felt was happening to my life. And if you look at it there in the, in the bottom of that toilet, it's, it's in pea yellow, is my life being flushed down the toilet. And you look at this thing and it's like, how can that filthy toilet you know, have any meaning to it? But to me, everything that had any kind of meaning whatsoever in my life was in that toilet. And it was like a sacred pot to me. And you'll read around in the circle of the things that I lost while I was in there, like the first thing to start out with my home, you know, my business, um, you know, my material things with my four-wheeler and stuff like that. Um, just running around with my friends, skiing, hunting, fishing, uh, and it keeps going around and around. And um, the, the um, prosecutor will have his little things that he says, you know, motion denied, uh, appeal denied, 90 day extension. This stuff can't get in this toilet here um, because it has no meaning to me. It has no meaning, it has no relevancy to me. Up in the top corner was a, a, my portrayal of what I looked like. I used a picture about four months before I got locked up uh, to paint from that and um, what I feel like I looked like back then. <clears throat> On my face, I got this metal plate screwed to my face and no one's listening. And that's the way you feel. It's, you're screaming and hollering, and no one's listening. They just want you to lay down and shut up. Over time, you can see the difference in the bottom down there. That was painted from my ID that you wear in prison. And over the mouthpiece there is the same thing. Still, no one's listening. It, it is so hard to get someone to listen to you when you're innocent to, to, to believe what you're saying. Lucky for me, my mom was fighting like crazy to uh, get someone to listen, and she finally got Mark to listen and help out. I just found out yesterday uh, by the guy showing us around town here that American Standard was a factory up here, and this is something that goes on in America every day, and I actually used an American Standard toilet to in my painting so just for symbolism and it turns out here i am in the town where they were made but that was the reason uh, behind that painting uh, on the back side they actually did a book uh, from the, uh, the the uc did a book called illustrated truth if you get a chance to look at it it's got a lot of the guys stories in it a lot of their artwork um, and the, the bio on their history and their case and then the reason for their art and on the back of mine it's you know some of the uh, colors and symbols that I use, what they represent. Um, and that was just my, my interpretation of uh, my, late, my life being wasted. I called it a stolen life. I was kidnapped by the state of Ohio, February 12, 1991. And um, that's just my representation of what that meant to me. <coughs> this painting here I did, of uh, as we progressed along in my case, Jim Petro, the ex-Attorney General of Ohio, at the time was the Attorney General and worked with Mark on a case, uh, Clarence Elkins case. You might have heard of it with the cigarette butt. The guy who actually committed a crime was in the same prison, in the same cell block that he was. And he found a cigarette butt, sent it out, Mark and his group did a DNA test, come to prove that the guy that was in that block with him is the one who committed the murder. And um, Petro seen this and was like, what's going on here? The prosecutor in that county didn't want to believe and didn't want to let Clarence out. Um, and she just kept fighting and fighting it. And Petro said, we got to do something here. Um, this can't be, this, this proves that this guy did it, this guy did it, he needs to be released. So he started getting an eye-opening experience here that things go wrong. He, at this time, was the top law official in the state of Ohio, the attorney general. And he couldn't believe that these things were happening. He left office, came on board with Mark Pro Bono onto my case. And when you get the Ohio Innocence Project 
with the Ohio Innoc with the Innocence Network and the ex Attorney General on your case, you hit the mega millions. I don't even play it because it's impossible for me to hit anything that big again. Just lucky. And this was my representation of Mr. Petro. You know, he was a he was a cowboy. He was the, the <coughs> law. And he started seeing that, well, maybe this is not always right. Maybe there is mistakes. And, you know, the, the defense people were the Indians. So he comes over onto the other side and starts looking at both sides. So now he's been on the cowboy side. He's looking into the Indian side. And it, to me, it's just this Indian, this Native American, is, is still holding on to his tradition. But he sees that there is something on both sides. I donated it to, to Mr. Petro, and, and I really appreciate the help that he did. He wrote a book, him and his wife, called False Justice. Uh, my case, the Clarence case I was talking about, and another guy. Extensive uh, a bio of Mark and the project at UC. It's a good read, uh, something to read. Um, it's got eight reasons why people are convicted falsely. Um, but that's, uh, we start out with these paintings. That's the reason I did those. You had a question. We're looking for questions. Yeah, let's go ahead and take questions. You can turn the lights back on. I'll, question. I'll answer questions. Question. I'd be happy to answer any question you have. Anything, I will answer any question. Mm -hmm. Why don't you repeat the questions? I can do that. So what happened to the, um, the younger person who took over your case? The guy, the cop who actually did this, uh, this was his first case. So the first case he had, he sent the guy to prison. He's still a cop. He's still doing this. You know, you get away with it the first time. How many more times has he done it? How many more people have been convicted wrongly? I have this great, beautiful girlfriend called Karma. She <laughs> has been running around visiting these people. Two days after I got out, his wife went to prison for stealing $340,000 from her work. So, you know. <laughs> the detective that came with him that night was the deputy chief director of the police department. Six months ago, he was fired for inappropriate contact with a 17-year-old, which if anyone in this room done what he did, it would be child pornography, and they would go to prison. Uh, he got fired, and that was it. He still gets his pension. But uh, she's coming around visiting him. We still got to get the detective at some point, but you know, he's a corrupt person and it'll come. And, you know, she'll, she'll come see him. She's a beautiful lady. I tell you. <laughs> the, um, the state, uh, the Montgomery County Prosecutor's Office and the Police Department, from the very beginning when we filed this, um, just knee-jerk reaction. This did not happen. These detectives are lying. Uh, this Kevin Cobb guy didn't do this. Even though other police departments that I have contacts with in other jurisdictions are like, this is a no-brainer. They want our information about Kevin Cobb because they're investigating him for crimes they believe he committed in their jurisdictions. And they're wanting our help because we're the ones that investigate him the most. Um, but they, they've dug in from very early on, committed themselves that, that Dean's guilty, they're not going to listen to anything, and they're continuing to take that position. When you're taking that position, nothing happens to the police officer because they've gone on record saying this never happened. The, the, the two detectives that were the original detectives that said they made all these records and files that were destroyed, uh, they just say, oh, they must be lying. So, we've actually we've actually took the uh, the uh, artist sketch from the night of the crime. They did an artist sketch. We took that artist sketch. We took Kevin Cobb from one of his arrests, split it right down the middle, laid it over, and it makes one perfect face. I can't believe we don't bring it around. Yeah, so I had to start bringing it. It is unbelievable that it just lays on there, and that artist got it so dead on. It's just amazing. Yeah, normally composite sketches are not very good. It's actually a bad process. It, con it contaminates the memory of the person as well. And they end up, it never looks like the person, but they now believe that that face in the composite sketch is the person who committed the crime. And so if they end up catching somebody that looks like that face, the victims would be very convinced that's the person. Uh, it's a long story, but, the, but that, in this particular instance, Kevin Cobb, is the, he's the one that did this crime. They did an amazing job of that composite sketch because he looks exactly like it. Matches right up. Yep. Are the three females apologetic to you? Have you had contact with them? 
No, I'm, I'm right now still on bond. I'm on bond and I'm, I have no contact with anybody who's involved with this. I can't. The state's still appealing both victories. Because of the appeal. It's all, it's all done. It'll take another year. Or two. What do you mean? Were they involved in you getting the three? The three victims, which is often the case, and this is a whole other psychological study, um, they've had the police officer telling them this is the guy that did it for 20 years. Well, they, they still believe that. Yeah. I have no animosity toward those people. They were tricked, duped, and, and just treated wrong, the same as me. I have no problem. It's not their fault. Um, the people who did this, the, the detective, the prosecutor, the General Motors people, I have all kinds of problems with. But those people have, you know, they were just tricked and misguided and misled through the whole process. And it's a shame for them because the person who did this kept doing it. This guy kept doing it. And they're, like he said, they're still actually investigating this guy for a murder you know, after I went to prison. So, you know, what they could have prevented if they got the right guy would have been, you know, untelling. What do you want to do for the rest of your life right here? after this is over? I do this right, I love doing this right here. Speaking and getting the truth, getting the word out that there's two sides to this. There's two, look at everything objectively. Look at both sides, form your own opinion. Don't form your opinion on what the whole crowd does. Be your own person. Look at both things. Uh, and fish. I, I've, been, yeah, I've been involved in so many of these cases. I've had so many cases reported in the media that when, I, when there's a big high profile case, like the George Zimmerman case in Florida or whatever, I don't believe anything I read in the media. It, unless you're personally involved, there, you, I cannot form an opinion. And it amazes me, my friends on Facebook will have these strong opinions based on something they saw on TV, it's like, you don't realize how the, the disconnect between what's in the media and what reality is. I guess you don't unless you've been in a field where you're in the media and you see for yourself the difference. Uh, but yeah, you cannot, you cannot just go along with the crowd and what the media is portraying. No, I, I always uh, say this sometimes is, if you look at what Hitler did with the media and how he controlled the people, it, it's the same thing in America. They can say whatever they want. people. You, I always said it, if, if they came on for three days straight and said Mickey Mouse was the one who bombed, the, the, ran the planes into the Twin Towers, people would be burning Disneyland down because the media <laughs> says it every day. They just believe the crap that spews out of it. And it's, my mom always called it propaganda and mama media. And they just could try to control your thoughts. And if you have to look at everything with your own facts and your own light on things. Don't believe everything you see in here. It's just not it. Even if you're looking right at it, you know, you can get on YouTube and look at stuff. It's like, no way. And, you know, it's fake. It's just, you have to really, and that's the thing with technology today. You, you start becoming a little more aware of the tricks they try to pull on you. And you just always have to be aware of it and pay attention. But I know this young lady here had a question. Yeah. Why do you have to be on Oh. No, I do have a question. Finally. Well, I told you I'd come up yes. for you. How did you get hurt? Yeah. I fell off a ladder. I was, I was working maintenance. We were painting ceilings, and we had a we jerry-rigged up this ladder on a cart so we could move around. And, and the guy hit like this cord here, and I'm going down. Just fell on my back, pinched my sciatic nerve, and it's just getting worse. Yeah. And there's no health care in prison. You know, we called it the vet clinic. You go down and see the vet. Um, they give you a Tylenol if you got your arm cut off. <laughs> good luck. You know. Give us your arm. We got to throw it away, but you know, good luck with it. There's no health care in it. I actually watched a guy pull five of his own teeth because there's no, you know, they said it'll take three months to get you into the dentist. Uh, when you're pulling your own teeth, you know that there's big problems. Uh, you know, you watch the first couple and it's like you're crazy, and then it's are you going to pull any more? Because I want to see it. <laughs> you know, it's entertainment. But the, the health care, and it's just, and, and the way I was let out of prison, if I was out on parole for $7, I could go see the doctor and, and have brain surgery. But because of the way I was let out, I have no options of nothing. And, you know, it kind of sucks right now. So come on with some questions, folks. Let's hear them. I have one for you. You're talking about the need to reduce standards for, like, the DNA technicians. I can answer that. <laughs> Senate Bill 77, this man got past him and Jim Petro. The preservation of evidence. 
the way they present evidence, the way they do the photo lineup, a great thing to read. Uh, actually, I've been to a couple conferences and talked to some of the big staff and stuff. Each state is starting to use it as a model of the way they're going to implement these laws in their states. Um, but he can speak a little bit. It doesn't that. go far enough. We got a, a law passed in Ohio that um, requires the police to do photo lineups blind, which means that the officer who is investigating it and has, I think it's number two, he can't be the one that takes it and shows it to the witness. It has to be somebody neutral who doesn't know. Now, the problem is, from what we can tell, many police departments aren't following it, and in the courts in those jurisdictions are not enforcing it. Um, so that's one thing we need to fix. We need to try to get it more widely followed. But it also only covers eyewitness identification. I mean, there's all kinds of problems with forensics and other things that I talked about with confirmation bias that aren't being touched yet. I mean, in 2009, the National Academy of Sciences, which is an independent science agency established by President Lincoln, very well respected, did a multi-year investigation into all these problems with wrongful convictions, came out with like a 500-page report. It's scathing, talking about the problems in our criminal justice system and all the changes we need to make. I mean, and it's dead on. You can read the executive summary on the internet. It's only about 25 pages. It's much easier to read. Talking about all these problems with forensics and CSI, all this kind of stuff, and what a joke it is. And I go around and speak to judges or prosecutors that they've never even heard of it. And it's like, you know, they're not bad people. They're overworked and underpaid. But you've got a ton of power. And, you know, you've got an obligation. You're putting people in prison. You're taking their liberty away to stay up on this stuff and try to do the best to do the best job you can and make this information more accurate. Every single time we get the wrong guy behind bars, not only is that a tragedy, because it's a tragedy for Dean and his family, we got the bad guy out to commit more crimes. Clarence Elkin's case, the, the, the brutal perpetrator that we ended up proving through the cigarette butt was living two doors down, and he actually looked like the perpetrator, how it was described, and he was a sex offender. He's right under the cop's nose. And because they, they focused on Clarence Elkins right away and they went on TV, pat themselves on the back saying, we solved this in three hours. They were, after they say that on TV, you're not going to change your opinion. Um, because they did that, um, Earl Mann, the true perpetrator, raped three little girls after that. All right, so their lives are messed up as a result of focusing on the wrong person. So it's not about being soft on crime. It's not about being tough on crime. It's about being smart on crime. And so the frustrating for, thing for me has just been how slow the reforms have been. It's not like there's a dispute in, in the psychological literature. It's not like um, other experts are saying, no, there's no confirmation bias. It's, it's undisputed. But still, it's very slow to get reforms done. And a lot of the, uh, the way the uh, system is where these people are elected, you know, they want to be tough on crime. They want to show that they're tough on crime. It's about political gain with them. And that's a big problem with the uh, system we have right now is they're just uh, moving their career along on these convi uh, convictions, and uh, that's just not right. You know, they shouldn't be. It shouldn't be like that. It should be about finding the truth, seeking the truth, what has actually happened. You can get the right person. It's not about moving along in your career. Yeah. Um, what was your experience um, going into prison and then coming out? Twenty years is a long time. So, how did you handle going from prison? and coming out into like the modern society now. And not being crazy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a hard thing to do. You're in there with some of the dumbest people on earth. <laughs> <laughs> the dumbest people. You can't get a five minute conversation with anybody about nothing. Um, but I actually grew up with a group of guys that I've known my whole life and stuck with me through this. And you know, they didn't turn their back on me. Uh, my family. Um, the community, you know, everyone in the community seen what well, this is absolutely crazy. And they, you know, you could see the evidence wasn't there, but they just kept pushing it. You know, the media just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, so I had a good support, you know, uh, uh, talking to my friends. They come and visit. Um, when you're in prison, it costs $6.50 to call somebody for 15 minutes. It costs $20 to call somebody out of state. So it takes a good friend to answer the phone. And, uh, you know, these guys are raising families and, you know, kids and everything. And they stuck with me. And my mom would, would call and uh, say, look, you know, Mark needs, needs to be in Cincinnati. Um, I need to be down here in two hours. And she'd call one of my friends. And they'd be like, do I need to dress up? Or can I be casual? What time do you want me to come and get you? You know, they just stuck and helped. And, you know, I always say if, if in life you're going to do a lot of things in life, you want to, you know, get a good career and, and all that stuff. One thing that the world doesn't have is a lot of good friends. Someone who sticks with you, 
someone who doesn't matter, they're with you through the bad, through the good, through it all. And if you can just be one thing in life, there's hardly anything better than being just a good friend. Uh, because, you know, people have bad things that happen to them, and um, that's when they need the help. It's not always when the good times are there. Um, that's to me, is a very important, that's what kept my sanity. You know, I could call, talk to these guys, and talk to normal people. They would come visit me and sit and talk to them and, you know, find out what's going on in the world. Um, while I was in there, you know, I met a few people who you could have a conversation with, but it was so rare that it, it's, it's just crazy. <laughs> And, um, and the big thing with now is with the meth, the, the meth and the crack and everything, you could take this whole center section right here and couldn't get two sets of teeth. And what's able, you know, the, the, the amount of, you know, the drugs is just such a bad thing in there too. Um, but just my friends and music, I listen to a lot of music and pain kept me sane. That was about it. I know there's some people up in the room, up in the other room, you need to start sending some questions down. Yep. It seems to be, when you said that the way you were let out of prison, it really hampers you now. That seems it's unjust too. Could something be done about that for other people to save yourself? Well, when I got out, I was on bond, or I was on, yeah, on bond. I was on an ankle monitor for five months. I couldn't leave the house. Uh, and the judge had actually thrown my case out. I had nothing against me, no conviction, nothing whatsoever. And they threw my case out. But the way it was done, the, the prosecutor had to have something to make it feel like he was getting something out of it. So the judge agreed to the ankle monitor. I was on it for five months. I'm on bond now. I've been on bond for two years. And the case has been thrown completely out. That's because of the appeals. Right. The, so the, they get done with all their appeals, which we're getting closer to. I actually, uh, we had a problem where when I got out, the way the statute is set up, and I was in, in for a sex crime, I had to register as a sex offender. You know, Mark's calling, it's like, there's, it's a gray area. So he's, he's like, they're going to try to lock you back up if you don't register. You can fight it. It's a five-year sentence for not registering as a sex offender if you're a sex offender. So what do you do? I'm not going back. So, you know, we agreed that I would just go sign up and had to do that. So you got a felony against you. You got your sex offender. I got to go down once a month, go pee in a cup for him. Um, what, what kind of job is going to hire you for that? You know, luckily for me, a lot of my buddies have their own companies. If I need work or need money, you know, I can call and say, you guys got anything going on and go to work for them. You know, they want me to work full time for them, but they built this business up for them. And my case was real high profile all over the news, and it would kill me if I went to work for them somewhere and someone recognized me and thought, you know, something bad, and they would lose business and lose, you know, I would just, it would drive me crazy. So I just do it, you know, randomly, and, and I just don't want nothing to affect their business. Up in the back. I'm getting questions from the other room. Well, let's hear it. Um, what was the worst part about prison? <laughs> I've heard that a lot today. What part was it worse? Um, you know, you, you get up in the morning fighting, you go to bed fighting. Um, it's just a continuous battle. It's, it's violence. It's so much violence, it's crazy. Um, I said it earlier today, one sound that will never leave my head is the sound of a head hitting the concrete, you know, and someone's head just getting split open. It never, it never leaves. It's the most disgusting thing you've ever heard. Um, just the violence. The violence is crazy. and, and you know, I'm guilty of it myself. You know, we'd, we'd be bothering people just to get them to fight, you know, for entertainment because there's nothing to do. There's just nothing in prison to do whatsoever. But one thing that I've noticed is I cannot stand the sound of a television. I hate it because it never went off for 20 years. A television never went I can't understand why people want to sit in front of them with all the stuff you can do in life. And uh, that's another thing that just drives me crazy as a television. But there's so much that bad about the food, uh, everything like that that goes with that. It's crazy, the food is. Did you ever reach a point during your sentence where you felt like uh, just, just committing or admitting to it? Just uh, no, to, to no. think about? No, no. It wasn't never going to happen. Um, actually, halfway through the trial, they came to me and said, we'll offer you 30 days, plead guilty, 30 days, we'll drop it down to gross sexual imposition, you'll go through reception, and get out 
and I told him 30 days, 30 minutes, 30 years. I did not do this. I will never say I did. I had three polygraphs, showed I didn't do it. I went to the parole board 16 years into my sentence. The first thing they want is you to admit guilt. Admit guilt will let you out. And I said, I didn't do it. You know, they, you, when you first sit down, they say, Mr. Gillespie, tell us what happened that night. I ain't got a clue. I wasn't there. So now I've got an attitude with them. So I'm a smart aleck with them. You know? And uh, I didn't admit it then. So I got four years. Do the four years, go see the parole board in 20. They uh, said, Mr. Gillespie, it appears that you may be innocent. By this time, he's on it. Jim Petro's on it. There's a book about it. The media has gone crazy with it. But we're not here to judge. We're not here. Let me see. I'm going to start over. Mr. Gillespie, it appears you may be innocent. But we're not here to judge innocence or guilt. We're here to impose a sentence of court order. And gave me three more years. So, you know, how can you sit there and say that to somebody and then give them that time? It made no sense to me. I was perfectly eligible for parole at 16 years. And um, a year later, I was out. So that proved they're wrong. And one, one group of people that I hate is the Ohio Parole Board. It's the most useless organization. All right, all right, I have two questions. Um, were you treated more harshly because you were a convicted rapist? And did faith or spirituality help you cope while you were in prison? The worst thing you can be locked up in prison for is child molestation. The second worst thing is rape. Lucky for me, I was a pretty big guy, and I was able to, you know, fend off a lot of that problem. Um, you yes. developed a lot of respect in the prison, too, just by the way you carry yourself. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as far as religion goes, I was raised Baptist, and uh, I was in a church three days a week with my mom. Uh, she's very religious, and he, I felt God left me. She kept on. She's very religious still. She learned a lot of cuss words from Mark that she didn't know before. But, but yeah, it, uh, and a lot of times religion is used in there. A lot of the, uh, the, the guys will use the church as a way to, I don't know what they're using it for. It's just... The way they used it just turned me off a lot, the way the church was. I did my own thing, my own, my own way with that, as far as religion goes. Are there any major consequences for falsely accusing someone of a crime? None whatsoever. Really? Okay. No, is there any consequences to falsely accusing someone? I have, is there any law on it? I mean, technically somebody can be charged with perjury. Yeah. Uh, but like the victims in this case that identified them, they weren't lying. Right. You know, they were just mistaken. Um, the, the officer committed perjury, but the, the police department, the prosecutor's office, has taken the position that he didn't say one thing wrong. So it's got to be somebody to prosecute. That's why he's not being punished. That's why nothing's happening. Right. So most of the time, I did a, um, I did a, an article on the Huffington Post recently about how um, in all these cases, when police misconduct is found by a court, so a judge has listened to the evidence and found the police officer did something wrong, they continue just practicing and get promotions. Nothing happens to them. Um, so you can Google my name and Huffington Post and that article will come up. Yep. Have you given up on faith in like, the justice system completely? Yeah, I don't, I don't trust it one bit. I, I, I have a couple friends that are cops, and um, I just, I don't trust cops. I don't, I mean, I trust my friends, but I just, um, you know, before I believed in the system, I flew the flag out front of my house every day. No way someone can go to prison for something they didn't do. Um, now, you believe that all the way through your trial, right? Well, absolutely. You didn't even take it seriously. This is even, a joke. Right. Even when I when they said guilty, I'm like, this can't be happening. There's no way this happens in America. And, uh, you know, it's happened a lot. It's become American standard. So it happens a lot. So I have no faith in it whatsoever. I have faith that I got the best lawyer in the world right here and uh, nothing to worry about. This guy's got 17 people out of prison in 10 years. 17 people. And you got the guy he was talking about, Raymond Tyler, 29 and a half years on death row. The most miserable place you can be on earth, death row, in America, and being innocent. It's just how he's still saying, I don't understand. Come on with the questions. Let's hear him. Come on, folks. Yes, back here. Why didn't the guy at GM like you? Well, <laughs> he sure didn't like me, that's for sure. Um, 
what had happened was my dad knew a lot of people, and uh, when I got out of high school, I went to an internship at General Motors, worked three months, did that program. A couple months later, they called me to come back to work. Um, my dad knew a lot of people to get me the job. I got the job. I walked out of high school, 84. I'm working at General Motors, making $14.50 an hour in 1984. That was good money. Um, they had friends that they wanted to get the job, so automatically there's animosity and anger with me. I was a pretty good smart aleck. You know, what are you going to tell me? I've got a good job. These guys were as old as my dad, you know, trying to tell me how to do things the old way. I knew how to do things the new way. And they, it was just always conflict, always conflict. And it just kept boiling and boiling and boiling. And the guy who actually took my stuff down used to work at that police department also. So he knew all those people. And had this, this guy's son, his best friend's son, was the one who took the case and did this to me. Yeah, the back. Um, in the 20 years of prison time, did you ever find a sympathetic prison employee? And what did you do your first day out of prison? Well, um, a sympathetic, I hate COs. I have a real problem with them. The way they, and it's bad because, you know, not all of them are bad. Most of them are, in my opinion. Um, just because of the way they act, the way they were trained to act. Um, I had one guy who uh, treated me real well, done a lot of things um, I can't talk about right now, but he done a lot of things for me that was really unbelievable and he could have got fired for um, the first thing, the first three days I was out, I didn't go to sleep. I couldn't go to sleep. I was afraid to go to sleep. Like, this can't be real. I don't want to wake up from it. Uh, 600 people came through my parents' house in three days to visit. And it, that's unbelievable. That is absolutely phenomenal to have that many people. And that's all I did was just talk to people I hadn't seen in a long time. And you take 20 years of not seeing someone I see my friends, I see my family, I see them age over time. I got off the bus and there's people standing in front of me that I've known my whole life and had no clue who they were. Um, that was a big thing and it still is right now. Um, but when I got out, I got off that bus and kissed the ground right in front of my house and you can look at that on YouTube. Um, <laughs> kissed the ground and just couldn't believe I was home. Yeah. Um, how did the Innocence Project come across your case or how did you come across the Innocence Project? Actually, Mr. Gossie was teaching at the University of Kentucky. He was a professor down there. There was an article in the paper that there was he was coming to Cincinnati and was going to start an Innocence Project in Ohio. We didn't have one. My mom's friend seen it in the newspaper. The next day, she was in Kentucky with her friend, beating on his door to make him take the case. And she was a bit bigger and stronger than him and forced him to take it. So, you know, once the Innocence Project takes your case, it's like hitting the lottery again. It's just unbelievable because the, the national recognition they have from it, the amount of people they got out of prison, the work that they do is just phenomenal. And um, when they take your case, it's the greatest thing ever. And, and like I said earlier, lucky for me, the ex-attorney general also is on there. So it was a big deal. It was a and once that happened, once he was on, the media was on it, every time something was done, him and his wife wrote the book, <clears throat> things changed a lot in prison for me. People started thinking, well, there is some validity to this. There, you know, maybe this is, maybe he is innocent. A lot of difference with the staff and stuff like that. It definitely changed how my daily life was in prison after that fact. Yep. Good girl, you're Yeah, we, we, me and her have actually been knowing him, going back and forth for 29 years, uh, back and forth. We're still talk, we're still friends. You know, she would get married, get divorced, she would still visit, uh, still talk on the phone. You know, we're friends, uh, even to this day. She's a little crazy, but <laughs> Mark will testify to that. But I think she's watching this, dude. Yeah, well, that's all right. <laughs> uh, But she's still a good friend, you know real good friend and she she went through a lot too this cop tortured her because actually his wife went to school with her and he sent her over trying to convince her of crap 
And it was like, are you kidding me? You know, illegal stuff. We know what his whole pattern is all the time. It's illegal. But yeah, we're still friends. What's the number one piece of advice you would give to anybody who's looking to go into like corrections or law enforcement or any kind of like legal field? The, the, the number one word I can use is objective. Just be objective. Look at the facts. Look at what is in front of you. Evaluate it for yourself. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Don't just rubber stamp it because everyone says this is it. Um, look at both sides. If you're elected, if selected to be a juror, this is one reason I like doing this, is because someone in here is possibly going to be on a jury. Someone's life's at stake. If they've went to a trial, you know, this guy is really, if someone goes to a trial now, there's really something I'm going to start paying attention because they start offering you such deals, most people take the deals. You know, you're taking a huge risk to take it to trial, obviously. And um, that's when I'm going to start paying attention if they're going on with a trial. Because look at me, 30 days. I could have took the 30 days. I did 20 years in prison. You know, you think back, should have, should have, could have, would have. Who knows? Um, just to be objective. Just to look at things for yourself. Make your own opinion. Not what the crowd does. I would have added that, too, with uh, police and prosecutors. You know, I, I'm... Most of my career was as a prosecutor, and I'm very pro law enforcement. I mean, as I said before, this is not about soft on crime, tough on crime. It's about being smart on crime. I want the bad guy off the street. I don't want them committing more crimes. Um, the, the, you know, again, so much of this is tied into psychology, and most of these wrongful convictions are not by police or prosecutors who are trying to do something wrong. Okay, but what happens is you get into an institution, you get into a system, and you become institutionalized. Even if you're very smart, prosecutors do, police officers. The people become sort of like monopoly money. You're doing it so often, you're going through routine, it's like an assembly line. Um, you sort of lose the humanity. The, the people you're arresting are just objects. Um, you no longer believe when anybody says something like, I'm innocent. You identify with your side, you become very unobjective. So if anybody makes an accusation against a police officer you work with, or something, this is what human beings do. It's not because they're bad people. Um, they become very insular. They no longer um, look fairly at situations. Um, I don't really know how to describe it in, in another way, but it's very hard to resist that when you're a prosecutor. Um, I mean, I have instances where I look back on, on my behavior when I was a prosecutor, uh, where things came to my attention that weren't right, and the way I looked at it at that time, I go back and look at it now, and I think, you know what, I was just going along with the system because I, I was part of a system, and that's what you're trained to do. Um, so, I, I, I would encourage anybody in law enforcement, I, I want you to go into law enforcement. I tell every single one of my students in the Innocence Project, if I could pick any job for you, I'd want you to be a prosecutor. Because, but I want you to do it fairly. And I want you to struggle hard against the system to try to make sure you individualize every single case. And you don't become institutionalized, you don't make it an assembly line. And you have the courage to stand up and say, this is a case where we got to make an exception. Um, that's not encouraged in prosecutor's office. Um, you don't get promotions if you if you're if you're soft perceived as soft on crime, but you gotta have the courage to do that. Yeah, and, and actually the problem is you see some of the same people over and over and over and over in the system. You keep seeing them over and over, and that's what calluses these people to make these judgments of everyone's the same, and that's not the case. You know, you do have the you know habitual criminals. Actually, when I was in there, one guy got out. He was out short enough the bed he left when he came back went to the same bed in the same week. You know, guys like that, you know, you got a problem with. But you gotta look at each thing individually every time and that's important. Yeah. Did you ever encounter any other inmates who felt might have been falsely Absolutely. I have a couple of friends that, that are Mark actually has a couple of their cases. Um, one of the guys is uh, Jerry McMean, he's seventy eight years old. They've done everything in the world to try to help this guy. And he's likely going to die in prison because no one's going to listen. None of the judges want to hear it. You can't get back in with the evidence they have now. Um, his stepdaughter wanted to move out and live with her boyfriend, and he wasn't going to allow it, so she accused him of rape. She'd done it 13 times before in 13 other foster homes, and this was the first guy who went to prison for it just to get her away. And, you know, this guy's probably going to die in prison for that, and that's a shame. But, yeah, I have definitely met people who I really feel are innocent, and he would be top of the list. 
tell your Blackberry story, this group will get a big kick out of that. <laughs> Making fun of me, are you? <laughs> oh, the, the big thing was when I got out, you know, when I went to prison February 1991, a cell phone was the size of a suitcase. Um, no one had a computer in their house, you know, IBM and GM and stuff like that had the computers. So there's no World Wide Web, there was none of that stuff. I'm on this, they rented one of these limousine buses to pick me up, and they handed me a phone, a phone had, that someone had called, and it was one of the little Blackberries that fit right here in the palm of your hand, and I'm looking at it like, someone's on the phone, talk to them. So I'm talking, listening, talking, <laughs> listening. Everyone on the bus is just laughing and just cutting up, and I thought, well, it was the conversation, what I was saying or something. And um, I keep doing this, hand them the phone, and, you know, they hang it up, and I said, what was so funny with that? And they said, it's not a walkie-talkie. <laughs> It's a telephone. Uh, th that's the big thing with, with when I got out was the technology is, just overwhelms you. I will never ever probably understand a computer. You people grew up with one. You don't know what it would be like without it. But um, I've got a pretty good computer. My friends bought me a really nice one and I get on there every day and look at the news and stuff. But to use it like it's supposed to be, I have no clue. I swore I'd never have a telephone, but now I can't go 10 seconds without, you know, checking it. I really hate it, but I love it. <laughs> he just has to make sure he's texting the right girlfriend when he responds. <laughs> so he doesn't cross him up. Yeah, it's a good thing it's a smartphone because the dummy using it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they're allowed to go anywhere, but um, there's not one in Mississippi, um, and I think Colorado. I think those are the only two states. And the problem is funding. It is. It, it costs so much money to operate one of these programs. It's crazy. The, you know, the cost of the legal work, the cost of the DNA analysis, the the funding is crazy. This guy volunteers to do this. He is an actual professor at the school. Volunteers runs this program. He's a part of the the board for the national project. Um, but it, it takes someone who's very passionate and willing to spend the time on talking to angry, evil people every day, just banging your head against the wall to try to get someone to listen. It takes a special person to do that. You know, luckily we got, you know, 46 or 47 in America in each state. But it's, you know, a lot of them are one guy volunteering a couple hours a week with a few students, you know, and it's just, that's how it gets started. You have to start somewhere. Fortunate in Cincinnati, we've got people who support it. We've got some uh, people who have donated some, some decent money to keep it going. But when you look at the 10 people, or the 10 years he's been in existence, got 17 people out on less than a half a million dollars a year budget. New York has 20 plus million dollars a year where it originated budget, and they can't even compete with the numbers he has. Um, it's a, it takes the passion is what the key is, the passion to find someone who wants to take the time to do this and be in a system like this where you're always banging your head. Uh, hopefully, you know, eventually, that's Mississippi really needs it bad. But that's a, there's a lot of corruption down there. Have you ever had contact with the guy that took your picture of the police department with double motors? No, I'm, I'm not allowed to see any of those guys or talk to any of them. Has he ever tried to contact you? Oh, no, I, I, no he don't want, he, I contacted him the other day through my lawyers with a lawsuit. <laughs> I'm sure he pooped his pants then, <laughs> but I haven't, no, uh, I, no, my mom kept track of him for a long time and knew where all of them was at, um, I just don't want to see him right now. Do you plan to help as well with the... I'll do anything this guy asks me. That man wants me to walk in a wheelchair, but I'm going to go in because he said it's all right. <laughs> he, he wants me to get in a lion cage with a meat suit on. I'm going to ask him what cut of meat. I'm, I'm doing this forever. I, I like doing it, and you know we got to get the word out. You know, we got to get people to understand there's two sides to this. It looks like uh, we got. Yeah, um, that is true. That because I, I like telling this one. When you're in, when you're in there. Um, you see a lot of violence, a lot of miserable people, a lot of mean people, a lot of people that just don't care. They give up on life. They don't care. 
being innocent in prison is bad. You, you, it is bad. It's one of the worst things that can happen. The most miserable people in prison are someone who killed someone drunk driving. They cannot sleep. They cannot think. All they have on their mind is they've killed somebody because they were drunk. And they just, it doesn't matter if they got the electric chair. It doesn't fix their head. And it is, you could sit there and, and when I went to, to London, you're in a dorm with 250 people. And there's 10 guys in there who's killed someone drunk driving. And you just hear them all night long, just waking up with nightmares. It is the most miserable thing you've ever, you just feel sorry for them. You know, because here's a normal person, went out with their friends, having a good time, killed somebody. I mean, how do you get that in your head? Most of the people in there are part of the criminal element. You know, they know there's consequences to what they're doing. But you, you just don't think that can ever happen to you. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter if you live two streets over. Do not drink and drive because you, you can't get it out of your head. It's involved. I've seen so many guys that just went crazy. And, you know, they could get four years, ten years, whatever it is, even when they got out. It's still a continued psychological mess that you can't fix. You just can't fix it. You have killed somebody for something stupid, and you're just a normal joke. It just, and, and some of the guys that were in there, you know, a lot of my friends that were in there were murderers. You know, they killed somebody. Uh, heat of passion, you know, they come home, their wife's cheating on them or whatever. They freak out, fit of rage. You, right, you just fit of rage, you just black out. Anyone can kill somebody. But it was it's a different thing when you go through that process other than a drunk driving thing because it just it's not supposed to happen. It's just not supposed to happen. Please don't drink and drive because it the you can't come back from it. The it's same way with texting. Texting anything that distracts you and where you because you end up killing someone, it's it's not supposed to happen. Absolutely. I haven't even thought about the texting thing, but yeah. What can people like us Spread the word. I mean, we're doing this so people. I mean, I'm pretty, pretty excited about coming here because criminal justice and forensic psychiatry and all that. Um, you guys are going to go into the. A lot of people here are going to go into law enforcement. But even if you're not, um, you're going to be on jurors. You're going to have opportunities throughout your entire life to keep an open mind, just not accept always what you're hearing. Um, and you know, we're fulfilling our mission if we're here, and a few people um, take that to heart, and it affects how they perceive things going forward. I promised Mark I'd rescue them at 8 o'clock. Uh, they, they've started their visit with us at 6.30 last night. They've been going nonstop since 7.30 this morning. They got a four hour drive ahead of them and he has an 8 a.m. appointment. I know we can keep going all night, but in fairness, I'm going to say thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. I, just, I, I need you to appreciate, I mean obviously the message speaks for itself. I need you to appreciate what they did in coming up here. Uh, if you read Jim Pichot's book, and I, I really suggest that you do that sometime when you get a chance to not, when you get the chance to read for fun. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> these, two, these two gentlemen are featured prominently. What, when I met them last night, I said, I said to Dean, I feel guilty. I'm so grateful that you are here to share this very important message. But I feel awful of what you had to go through to deliver this message. But how, what an amazing man he is to keep positive and, and doing that. And Mark Gotch is headed to Italy. I'm trying to convince my dean I need to go follow him and do a, do a follow up to this. I'm not sure I'm successful with that. Uh, but speaking of our dean, Dr. Ward, would you please come forward? We have a small token of appreciation for our gift. And read the uh, the book also, Illustrated Truth. It's got a lot of these guys' in it. Um, it'd be great to read too. Thank you. All.